Hello again. Today we're returning to the HBO drama series Rome and we've got on to the fifth episode for this week. So it's uh, the ram has touched the wall and it is, has a lot in common with the number four, the one we looked at last time, in that it's, it's relatively slow paced and it builds on from the themes from that episode in that most of the time, for most of the episode, Caesar and the bulk of our characters are in in or around Rome um, and you have this back and forth with Pompey and leading senators like Cicero, Metellus Scipio, Cato, Brutus um, are sitting there in camp pondering what to do, trying to negotiate with Caesar and it, it begins with the reception of Caesar's offer which you've had in the, the previous episode where he's essentially saying you know um, making them offers that they're uh, an offer that Pompey will want to refuse but the Senate won't now we've talked a lot about that and how this probably really gets things the wrong way round um, I think it has the same sort of strengths and weaknesses as the previous episode it's perhaps a little bit more um, dramatic from the point of view of the character development more happens more comes to a head at this point but it's it's very similar and it is one of those episodes that suffers a little bit because had the production team and the writers and everyone got to make the much longer succession of series well, whether it's three or whether it's five there are various rumors as to how many they wanted but everything covered in much more detail rather than the second series having to rush through an awful lot and cover about 14 years um, because of that change, this seems quite slow paced and it seems a little bit out of proportion and the, the things that are covered in this, you think, well, if that's all the time you've got, you probably wouldn't have done it this way. But of course, this was produced and written and put together before they really knew what was happening. So it, it does suffer from that in that I would say, while there are some good, good elements within this, there's a lot that, for my personal taste, I, I find less satisfying with an episode like this because it does seem to be treading water to some extent and um, from the historian's point of view that gives the very wrong impression about Caesar's Italian campaign. Now again, I, mean, I noticed people picked it up in some of the, the comments and that sort of thing to the last one, they don't have the budget or perhaps the appetite to do lots of battles in the, the, the Civil War any more than they want to do lots of battles in Gaul. Gaul is summed up with one battle, that's really the one set piece battle scene you pretty much get in uh, the first half of this this series and you get some some fighting later on in Egypt but you don't really see much of the civil war you see the aftermath you see lots of sword fights and skirmishes and brutal struggles with our main characters but often outside the context of the war and partly that's budget partly it's also one suspects there is a great danger if you put lots of battles in a series that unless you do it very well they can all seem very much the same so there are, there are all sorts of reasons, but let's, let's look at the, the episode itself and what happens. And we'll go back to the start where it begins with Pompey and his allies debating what to do with Caesar's, um, Caesar's offer, which as we've seen, you've had the young Octavian working out as Caesar encourages him that he's, he's making an offer that's not intended to be taken seriously. He doesn't expect them to accept and therefore um, it's there to divide Pompey and his allies to try and show so discord in the opposing camp. Now there were periods of negotiation in the Italian campaign but the Italian campaign in 49 BC is very very brief. Caesar crosses the Rubicon in January by early March he's there at Brundisium in southern Italy, Brindisi today and Pompey escapes and goes off to continue the war from his base in Macedonia there were, as we've said in the previous episode, there were several attempts at negotiation on both sides. Everybody's trying to seem reasonable and make, make out the opposing people as the bad guys, the ones who are the, the rebels who are breaking the, the rules, breaking the law. Obviously, it's easier for Pompey and his allies who present themselves as the true Senate, the real Senate, all the important men of the Senate have gone with that. Not entirely true. There's an awful lot of people who've remained neutral in Rome. And that's again hinted at when Caesar is spending money to buy supporters from these neutrals, these waverers, and you know, his slave Posca is warning him that uh, you know, we're, we might be spending too much, this man isn't that important. Caesar talking about the, the advantages he'll gain, that that's far more important than manpower. 
but really it's about 10 weeks or so and the whole slightly less and the Italian campaign is settled and given that you've got a march from the top of Italy right the way down south bringing in more reinforcements you've started with just the 13th legion the 12th will arrive by the end of the campaign Caesar's probably got about half a dozen including fifth allowed I the the one formed from Gauls that's become a regular legion um, all experienced troops all highly committed and uh, well motivated and they get on a roll there's momentum to this no one expects Caesar to move in winter and then move as fast as he does and attack so boldly when the numbers are against him at least superficially but the difference is he's got good troops well well trained troops and Pompey and his men haven't because the only decent legions are the ones that very recently were fighting under Caesar again something that they've hinted at a little bit in previous episodes so much of the negotiation that they present as happening relatively late you know bear in mind it's the second episode when Caesar crosses the Rubicon we're now in episode five and it's only now that we at the end of this episode that we get to the end of the Italian campaign and it's presented as very much a stuttering advance and there are vague talks or uh, talk about Caesar's legions advancing while he's hanging around in Rome and that Pompey's men keep on retreating, keep on getting beaten or retreat. We don't see any of that, and that's sort of a throwaway line, and I suspect one of the ones... It, it's, again, looking back at this, I'm pretty sure quite a lot of the scenes that were more political about negotiation in this episode were cut by the BBC when it was first shown, um, as they sort of rushed into it and, and stuck with the soap opera elements. And the soap opera elements are dominant in this episode, but in the full form there is at least an attempt to show a back and forth. Now Pompey and the senators with him, you know, Cato being the bitterest opponent, reluctantly decide to accept Caesar's terms to try and get a ceasefire, a lull, and what part of the deal is that Pompey will go off to Spain and this sort of thing. Now there are elements of this that come from some of the real negotiation, but really much earlier than it's presented. Although of course the, the show is vague about time, but the the impression, and again it comes back to the proportion of screen time that you devote to what's going on now compared to right I need to open the door to let Gussie go out there you go Augustus right he's obviously decided to go for one of his morning strolls having uh, sat beside me staring at me to um, he's clearly decided there's there's not much there you go you might just hear him in the background giving a call out uh, I think the poor cat's still looking for his his sibling that we lost uh, a couple of months back anyway yes Gussie so I apologize for the cat noises that may be picked up on the microphone but um, there's not much I can do about the, that, the poor thing. He's already been fussed a lot this morning. And uh, there we go. Anyway, if we look back to January, and uh, late January, and curious enough, uh, a letter Cicero wrote on, well, what would, after the Julian reform of the calendar become my birthday, um, he writes and says that terms were accepted with the proviso that Caesar must at once withdraw all the garrisons from the towns, when he, which he'd occupied outside his province. Once he'd done that, they replied that we should return to the city and settle the matter in the Senate. I hope all present that it will be possible for us to have peace, for one leader regrets his rash folly and the other his lack of forces. And that's essentially the, the truth of the situation there expressed by the real Cicero in 40, 49 BC, that Pompey's botched things, that both have miscalculated. Caesar's a little bit surprised that the other side are willing to fight. On the other hand, Pompey's trying to fight without the resources to do it, so he's in serious trouble. So that's in January, just a couple of weeks after the Rubicon. Again, something we've already mentioned in the last episode. Um, in reality, Cicero wasn't with Pompey and the army at this point, and he stayed in Italy for some months until after Pompey had left, and only then, later on, decides that he ought to go and join Pompey and his, his allies from the Senate in Macedonia. And Cicero really, he stays out of Rome because he's still got Imperium, the right to military command, because he's just come back from his province in Cilicia, and he was hoping for a triumph, which of course has all gone out the window because people are too preoccupied with uh, this civil war breaking out. Um, but uh, he actually stays in one of his country villas, and it's interesting that later on in this episode he talks to Brutus on screen and suggests, oh, I think I might slope off and just, just live quietly in the country and you're welcome to come with me. Um, that's in fact what Cicero was doing in reality he's not there now I can understand the need to have a character you recognize an important character playing a role at this stage and it's quite a nice little exchange because Brutus says no I can't do that um, 
you know, uh, and then suggest to, to Cicero, it's fine for you to do it. I'm sure your reputation will survive. People will know you're, you're doing this for honourable reasons, at which point Cicero points out, you get the sort of hint that he's the new man. Um, you know, it's all right for you. You're from an established family, a big reputation. I can't afford to damage damage my um, my status, my honour, my reputation in any way. It's, it's nice. I like little bits like that, the throwing in that are reflecting something of the reality. So even though it happens completely out of chronological sense, um, nevertheless, it's nice they put that in. Um, you get other negotiations that um, Caesar's, the letters go with this offer, and then Caesar says he's asked to go back to Gaul, abandon Armenium and disband his forces. And he describes this in his own account as an unfair deal. And Pompey promises to go off to his provinces in Spain, but they don't give any date for when he's going to do that. So in the show, they have Pompey sends back a letter saying, I'll accept this offer um, to Caesar's surprise. So Caesar is then stunned, amazed, and he's talking with Mark Antony and Posca. And, you know, what are we supposed to do? This is damaging politically if I say no. I've suggested peace. I can't go back on that without some excuse. Posca notes the pretext that Pompey refuses to meet Caesar in person. And then Caesar, and you sort of see him as a politician, building up how he'll express his utter shock and horror that... Um, and the insult implied by this that Pompey won't meet him, won't talk to him, and that shows the bad faith on their part. And it, it, it's quite nicely done. It's not actually a reflection of the of the real debate. The bigger question is, you know, Pompey saying, "Well, I'll go off to Spain, but I won't tell you when." Um, and of course, maybe the show is right in suggesting that each side is fairly insincere by this time, or at least the Pompeians have only become sincere because they're losing. But it's, it's very prolonged. You've had bits of negotiation for several episodes. And um, from Caesar's point of view as well, you could understand his perspective saying, well, let's settle all this in the Senate. Well, they've had well over a year before the Civil War has started to settle this matter in the Senate, and it hasn't worked out. Um, his opponents are strong enough to um, be harsher to him than they are to Pompey, and although there seems to be a majority in favour of you know both disarming, let's avoid civil war, let's have peace, those aren't the critical people, the really important, prestigious ones, and there's a and the, those are so determined that they're not going to give in. So you come back to this stubbornness, this, this bloody mindedness, basically on both sides that neither is going to back down. Um, so this is quite interesting, but it's it's partly a background. They've obviously decided within the story they want to have Caesar in Rome, they want to have Sevilia and Attia involved, and then at the same time they can run parallel threads with Pullo and Varinus, to some extent involving Octavian and others and Varinus and his domestic problems. Um, so everybody's together, and I can see the convenience of this from a narrative point of view. But as I say, it, it's artificial because Caesar didn't hang around in Rome. He um, reaches Brundisium by the 8th of March, having you know, crossed the Rubicon in the second week in January. Um, that's a long time, and he's fought a few actions on the way. And when he gets to Brundisium, there is some rearguard action as the Pompeians are trying to cover their withdrawal. There's an attempt to build a mole out to um, cut them off. But whereas you keep seeing that one of the, the you know the themes emphasised in this show is Pompey looking out to sea and others looking out to sea, and it's an empty sea. Um, you know, they're just on a beach. They're not in a port. There's just there's nothing there. There's no ships. And again may well be a budget thing you have quite a nice background of as you've done several times in the show of a sort of roman camp stylized but okay you know it suggests the numbers that they don't really have in terms of extras it does it nicely um pompey of course has been gathering ships from fairly early on he's made the decision to leave italy quite quite early in this campaign by a basically a pragmatic calculation that look i haven't got enough troops of good enough quality and that i can uh, can be relied upon to face and defeat Caesar here, and he will go off to Macedonia to mass his forces there, ready to return, uh, uh, or waiting for Caesar, essentially. Or, you know, the, the famous quote was, Sulla potuit ego non potero, Sulla did it, why can't I? Or, that's that effect. Um, and he will go off and wait for Caesar in uh, Macedonia, in um, Greece, drawing upon his connections throughout the eastern provinces of the Mediterranean, of the Roman Republic's empire, that um, he's reorganized so recently, back in the 60s. So he's appointed most of the dynasts around there. That's why people like Cleopatra send aid to him, as does everybody else 
from the area. So, you know, on the whole, this area obeys Pompey, sees him as the legitimate Roman leader and sends the troops, sends the money, sends the food, sends the ship, sends all the things that he asks for. And then the other um, factor, obviously, is that he's there in Greece with a big army. You probably don't want to upset him. And again, Caesar is seen as the underdog for... Um, the, the first year or so of the Civil War, really, until till Pharsalus and that campaign, there's still the perception that Pompey's probably going to win in the end because it's Pompey and because the resources are on his side. So we get that staring out to sea, but we don't get any hint of the fighting. We don't really see any ships. We don't... Um, it, it, it's, it's rather drawn out, and as I say, that comes back to the, the starting point that because the whole pacing of the story was changed fundamentally when they they cut the thing short, it makes these episodes not quite work within the balance of the overall two series of the show as it became. Um, they seem a bit slower, they, they've drawn out this bit of, as I say, what's well, just a, a few months and then they're going to rush through the rest of the Civil War in about the same time. So it, it's a um, Part of the part of the reason it doesn't quite work are factors beyond the control of the people making it, and it still has its interesting points. But the big theme of this episode, really, you know, it's, it's a background going on. It's providing the sort of framework. It's the negotiations with um, with Pompey and his allies, and between them and Caesar. Now Caesar is there in Rome, and you see Caesar renewing his love with Servilia, and it's very much, you know, it's. It, the early scenes they're quite charming there's a sort of sense of almost you know teenagers hugely in love with with each other even though these are middle-aged people um and it's all about romance and devotion and love it's not about politics at all and you don't get any discussion of oh well you know your son's off there uh fighting against me um Attia becomes jealous of this so it's setting up the the Attia Sevilla rivalry which is a big big theme um in the show and their characters. Now bear in mind both of these women in reality were married uh, and you don't see either of the husbands. In the same way you don't see Octavia's husband Marcellus who's still around at this point. Um, you don't see uh, Marcus Philippus, um, Attia's second husband, because she remarried within a year or so of um, the death of Octavia and Octavia's father, um, Gaius Octavius, as was normal for an aristocratic woman who's still young enough as you know, still able to breed more children, but also very useful as a, a political connection. Um, but again, they don't fit in the story. The emphasis is on these powerful, ruthless, ambitious, manipulative women, um, you know, neither of whom are presented as terribly nice, though I think Servilia is seen as a bit bit gentler than Attia. Attia is very much the, the sort of, you know, the uh, over-the-top mother from hell. Um, and it, you know they play them very well. The actresses who in the parts they they do it as they're written, as the characters are written, and they develop them and they turn them in this. But it isn't it isn't reflective of any historical reality, or at least any evidence we have for historical reality. So Attia gets um, we don't see it happen, but we learn afterwards that um, the the Jewish horse trader that he she deals with and uses as an agent. He gets people to go out and paint obscene graffiti about Caesar and Servilia on various walls where they'll be seen. And um, you'll, Caesar is walking through the city with Calpurnia being pulled in a lit, uh, sorry, carried behind him in a litter. And she starts to see these, gets deeply offended. And Attia has decided that Servilia is becoming too close to Caesar while she is losing influence because. Um, He's refusing her invitations to go to dinner. She has come again, it's from the last episode, this misapprehension that um, Octavian has been having an affair with Caesar um, because of the, the mistake over Caesar having an epileptic fit and all this sort of thing. And that's a disappointment. She thought she had some political leverage there. Um, it's, it's, she moves very quickly from you know, this is fine, and then to, oh no, I'm worried about this, Caesar should be off fighting. Mark Antony is, of course, telling her that Caesar shouldn't be hanging around, and she's got this ongoing affair with him. Again, not the slightest shred of evidence for that, and, and Antony at the time is more famous, particularly afterwards, for his um, his main mistress was an actress, um, and she figures, she figures too publicly for what's considered to be proper behaviour in the, the months and years where he's left effectively as Caesar's man in Rome and in Italy. 
um, which would have been interesting, but I can see it's another whole character and it's, it's, you know, it's a path they didn't want to take. They've simplified things, they want their cast. It's quite a big cast, really, but they want to focus on keeping things understandable, which clearly works. Calpurnia is horrified. She threatens to divorce Caesar um, unless he ends things with Servilia. Um, Caesar then goes and ends things with Servilia. There's a particularly nasty scene where they argue and then he, he slaps her first, then hits her quite hard a couple of times. Um, again, you know, this is all fantasy. It, it, it's nasty and it's part of, you briefly see a sort of fairly nice Caesar in the early scenes with Servilia. On the whole, the attitude of the series is that they don't particularly like Caesar, and Kieran Hines makes him, you know, sort of basically a sociopath, which is an argument you can make. Um, I'm not sure it actually works that way. The problem is historically the affair didn't end, and Caesar and Servilia are on very good terms right the way through until his assassination. And you know, you have the stories of whether it was still a passionate physical relationship in those later years. It's hard to say. Caesar obviously has lots of other lovers, um, but you have talk of, you know, Servilia got to buy down property of defeated Pompeians that had been confiscated from them at knockdown prices, and you have that, that Cicero joke because um, Caesar's also credited with having an affair with one of Servilia's daughters, uh, Tertia, um, Junior III, who is married to Cassius, in fact. Um, and Cicero jokes that, you know, it's it's a really good deal for Servilia, but of course she got a third off. The implication being the gossip claiming that the mother has basically set up one of her daughters to have a fling with Caesar, um, almost prostituting her to the point where, you know, it helps to... But that she's a close ally with Caesar. But of course the interesting thing about all of this is that you have this evidence that as far as everyone was concerned, and of course this is an illicit affair but one that a lot of people know about, relations remain very close between Caesar and Servilia, but Servilia is also part of the, or at least is aware of the conspiracy led by her son and her son, uh, Brutus and her son-in-law Cassius that will murder Caesar. So in many respects, there's actually a more interesting dynamic going on there that emphasizes the, the keen politician and the ambitious individual within Servilia. And one of the reasons one suspects why Caesar found her so attractive was that she was fiercely intelligent, knowledgeable, savvy and ruthless politically, just like Caesar and just like Cleopatra. These are women you feel that shared a lot more with him in common. It's not just physical attraction, though I'm sure that's there as well. Um, to the extent where even though she has a lover, she decides that her son is more important and she is willing to back him and assist him and make sure that he prospers, even if that means sacrificing the, the man that she's loved. Um, now, how you would write that, you would present that at a different time, and of course the conspiracy itself doesn't get quite so much um, screen time and development time as it could have done, but again, it's a question of, of priorities, of how the, the series is structured, and because obviously this first series has got to include Cleopatra and all sorts of other stuff as well. There's a lot that goes on. So, you have... Um, this, as I say, nasty scene where Caesar um, rejects Servilia and says, I'm not coming back, having previously in this very tender moment promised that he'd never leave her again and all this sort of thing. Um, their relationship is made entirely one of personal passion. There's no political element to it. Um, although they talk a little bit while they're playing a game um, of sort of, you know, should I be ruthless, should I be not, should I give mercy, all this sort of thing. There, there's an element, but it, it's the way it's done. Um, so Attia gets away. Attia's won a victory over her rival, Servilia. Um, again, this is this is the. It's one of the assumptions, one of the basis of the series of these these two strong, ruthless women competing with each other. Um, you then have um, a scene where several things happen in the show because the other point of the episode is you've seen. Varinus's business plans all going pear shaped. So, you know, he's early on very confident in his money and then talks about these slaves that have been fattened up and are going to be sold, goes to the, um, the slave trader and these sort of slave pens, these cages. Um, again, you know, there must have been some sort, of, some sort of means of keeping large numbers of slaves while waiting for sale and finds out that all bar a small boy, all of his allocation of slaves from his Gallic plunder, they've all died, they've all caught a disease. I can't remember 
called it Bloody Flux or something like that, and they've all they've all died. Um, so you know, and the fellow's still trying to still going to charge him for the food they've eaten in the meantime. So his business plans have been going badly. His security of this sort of you know an investment basically that's all now gone, and. Um, he for a while goes and meets up with the gangster the fellow we've seen before and is hired by him as you know he doesn't quite realize he can't quite understand or is reluctant to believe that he's basically just as a as a hitman as a thug um and you know they go in and they're, they're threatening some um group of presumably indian traders they describes one of them as a hindu and all this sort of thing again certainly not impossible in rome though probably more common a century or so later um, and as always with these things how many people there were certainly um, communities from India settled on the Red Sea ports in Egypt in probably in the, under the Ptolemies and certainly in the Greco-Roman period uh, and it's quite possible that some went further uh, and came as far as Rome I and mean, we hear of an embassy which is a slightly different thing uh, from an Indian leader coming to Augustus in while he was in Spain um, during his reign, so you know, it, it, it's perfectly feasible, nice showing the how Rome has become very much a, a world center uh, because there's so much money there. You know, people want luxuries, they want exotic things, and human nature being what it is, people will be willing to travel a long distance and carry goods a long distance to to make a profit. Um, you know, he's told to break the, this man's arm when he hasn't. He's supposed to be not playing. Um, debts to the gangster, he does that but then he refuses to cut his throat, goes back to Niobe and his family and it's sort of, sort of what shall we do? Um, he decides having rejected Mark Antony's offer to rejoin the army in the last episode, he goes back cap in hand to Mark Antony, says I'd like you know, change my mind, accept the offer, Antony plays it quite hard and reduces the, the bounty that he promised him. Um, they're slightly, I mean, he, he becomes an Evocatus. They talk a lot about the Evocati. Uh, they don't really define what they are. Essentially, at this period, it means uh, someone who's already served their military time and rejoins um, the army. And in his case, he's going to be a prefect, a praefectus. Um, these appear in Caesar's narrative and in the narrative of that period, but they're not. The rank doesn't seem to be quite so clearly defined as it will become after the Augustan reforms. Again, talk a little bit about this in the Augustus and the army thing, and we'll do when we do a more detailed look at senior officers in the Roman army, which is, is one of the questions that's come through the Q&A, but it's, it's too long for a sort of five minute answer. Um, we'll go through this sort of thing in this process. but. Um, so it, it's based on something. They get a bit sloppy at one point. You know, you're now what? You're now Evocati. Well, you, you know, again, it's it's probably uh, having been influenced by Latin teachers at a, um, a vulnerable age. It should be Evocatus, obviously, if it's singular. Um, they use it as slightly more defined and precise than than perhaps we understand how it's used in this term. But fair enough. He goes back as a, a senior rank under the empire. If you'd been a former primus pilus, as they you know, keep seeing his form first be a centurion, you would automatically become an equestrian. Um, they don't deal with that at this point, but there are developments later on with Varinus. He then goes to a temple of Mars to sort of be formally readmitted and get a blessing as a soldier. Uh, and there's a whole sequence of religious elements at this point that's quite nicely done. And one thing, while they don't always 100% stick to the facts of what's probably going on, it's nice that they put this religious, this ritual element into the story to give it a flavor of a different world. But because these things were so fundamental, they were everywhere in the ancient world. You know, almost anything you did, there would be some ritual component. So we have Varinus, I mean, what you would normally do is, is renew the military oath and you'd come back under military law. You know, there were clear distinctions in status. Um, there's an interesting anecdote about the elder Cato when his son, in the second century BC wants to join us another campaign having already fought with one army and you know the Cato is supposed to question we'll make sure you do this legally that you, you you're actually um, enrolled as a soldier again formally so that you can fight and kill on behalf of the Republic um, because it would be an impiety it would, it would be questionably legal if you just turn up as a volunteer and, and fight because you feel like it without sort of checking making the both the the, the legal and the spiritual paperwork, making sure that's in order. Um, so it's it's interesting though it, it's done that even though there's not really any great basis for what he's actually doing, 
but it's a nice touch. Uh, at the same time, Attia brings in another aspect of Roman religion, ritual, call it what you will, where she formally curses Caesar and Attia, scratching onto lead, um, lead that then folded up as a curse tablet. We have these are very familiar from um, several sites throughout the empire, but particularly there's a large numbers have been found at the Aquasunas at Bath um, in southwestern Britain, and they are lead tablets where you've you've scratched on the curse and you then throw it down to to reach the gods of the underworld the idea there's this hot spring coming up from the earth therefore that should take you down to to hades to the underworld um in this case they're burying them in cracks in the wall uh, it's a nice you know again it's not quite 100 percent how it was probably done but it's it's certainly an aspect of roman ritual that is very odd very alien to a modern eye and it's nice that they put this in i mean the um the cursed tablets you get from later on, and they're mostly imperial from places like Bath, are very formulaic, and they have, you know, they often tend to begin, because quite often it's someone cursing whoever's stolen their bath towel or uh, something they took with them into the bathhouse and has vanished, and they, they have these things, um, whoever it is, be he um, man or woman, boy or girl, slave or free, and in later periods, pagan or Christian, if they don't return this, then may, you know, they're veins turn to, to molten lead there you know all sorts of detailed things and the sort of stuff she says about caesar and attia is related to this this type of of, of curse thing i'm not sure whether there are precise examples of the ones they have but it's, it's fair enough so that was interesting again as i say this is artificial there is no sign whatsoever of a break between Sevilla and caesar at this point or indeed at any point an open break and anyway it's all fantasy that Caesar spending these weeks in Rome in the first place in 49 BC because he doesn't. He rushes on, his visit is very brief, and then he moves on because the campaign is what matters. But you have these things going along, and then the other subplot is that um, Pullo is enlisted by Attia to teach the young Octavian how to fight. Um, and again, it, it's, you know, the... Um, the actors play it very well. The relationship between these two is important, the same as the one with Varinus. You know, you get it's the idea that you'll be a half decent, I can take, make you a half decent swordsman. And Octavian saying, I'm sure the, the graveyards are full of half decent swordsmen. It's, I'm not going to be good at this. I don't, don't want to learn it. It's too much work and I, it's not going to help me. Um, but the relationship then develops of them when Pullo asks Octavian for assistance because he thinks that there's something going on between Niobe, Varinus' wife, and her brother in law. Um, worried about an affair, wants to know the truth, so he basically kidnaps this bloke and gets Octavian, and they go down into the sewers, and then they threaten this man. And it's it's to show the straightforward Pullo, who's trying to do the right thing for his friend, even though he's pretty brutal about it, and the, the cunning, insightful Octavian, even though he's just a kid. I mean, if... Um, we were sticking to the strict chronology he'd be 13 going on 14 by the end of the year at this point obviously you can't expect one actor to age at the pace of reality so he's still but the idea is you know this is still someone who's not yet come to formal manhood uh, by roman standards and yet he's you know this chap answers babbles out pullo satisfied october said no you're lying um and you know they they it's it's very ruthless it's all this well you're going to die do you want to die quickly or should we make you suffer and torture you um, with that black humour of, you know, Octavian tells Pullo to get on with and says, well, I've never tortured anybody, I don't know what to do. And they have this back and forth, oh, well, let's, let's cut off his thumbs. Um, in a grim way, it's humorous. Um, and it, it, it develops the characters. It's, of course, complete fantasy. Um, and it's part of this, you know, the back, the, the subplot for Varinus that will build up. And, of course, this has big implications for one of the later episodes at near the end of the series, uh, which we can, can deal with at that point. So it's setting up one aspect of all of this, and it's understandable with this sort of show, is that all the big politics, or a great deal of them, are made to depend around personal um, sort of backstories, personal events, ambitions. So Caesar's been slacking off in his campaign against Pompey and could already have defeated him, according to Mark Antony, because he wants to spend time with Servilio because he's in love with her and it makes she makes him happy. And then he's humiliated by Attia and the threat from Calpurnia makes him repudiate Servilio, go off and chase Pompey down. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's fantasy while 
I am sure, and in spite of the instinctive reluctance of any historian to believe this, many of the great events of history have probably hinged upon the personal emotions of an individual or, you know, somebody feeling ill that day or just throwing a, a tantrum or a temper and uh, this sort of thing in the same way that you can clearly see the you know, shenanigans of many modern politicians have so much to do with personal rivalries, likes, dislikes, dirty linen in the closet, all this sort of thing. This is pushed to an extreme in this show. So the Civil War becomes very much about these these personal things. The historian in me would like something else, would like more of the politics, more of the warfare. I understand why they do this. And for many people, it'll just work as a drama. So it, it's all contrived, but you're building up the characters to how they will play out. And clearly, given that Octavian turning into Augustus was going to be the big theme of this sort of great sweeping um, succession of series they were planning, and that doesn't fully happen, it's the idea of trying to show. I mean, I think... Um, it's fine and it's very well played by the cast, uh, but it is, this is all fiction. You know, this, 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 this is imagination. And as I, I've mentioned before, some of the sort of subplots with um, Varinus and Niobe is just, I'd like them to be talking about other things. The same with many of the subplots with Atia and Sevilla as they develop. I would prefer to see what else was going on, but that's not the focus of the show. That's not their choice. And it's, you know, it's their right to do what they want. So you end up with the Civil War resuming. Caesar tells Mark Antony, right, we're marching tomorrow, but you're staying here. You're going to govern Rome for me. Now, that's what he really did. Mark Antony doesn't have much of a military role in uh, most of the Civil War. He will be called over and summoned with reinforcements to the Macedonian campaign in 48 BC. So he's there at Pharsalus, but has not played a major role in the rest of the campaign. And then after that, he doesn't serve again in the field until Spain in 45 BC. Uh, again, one day we'll do some talks on Mark Antony the soldier and his military record because it's it's interesting because it isn't what people expect. It isn't the stereotype of this you know tough military man who's very good at fighting because actually he doesn't do a lot of it and he's not terribly good at it. Um, but anyway, that's that's history and that's for another day. This is about the drama series. Caesar arrives to find Pompey's camp burned and Pompey gone off to Macedonia. As I say, not quite what happened in reality. He does catch Pompey before he leaves, but he isn't, isn't able to stop him from leaving. But again, from the point of view of drama, you've got the point across. Pompey has now gone over the sea to Macedonia, to Greece. Um, you then have, it's, it's stuff they don't really have time for. Caesar will then very quickly head off to Spain. So he doesn't spend much time in Rome or Italy at all in 49 BC because Pompey has eight or so legions plus auxiliaries in the Spanish provinces that have been allocated to him by the Senate. And these are fairly well-trained and experienced troops. And they're obviously a significant force. So Caesar chooses to face them partly because they're important, but also because Pompey has gathered up all the shipping to transport his own army across the Adriatic to Macedonia and also to deny it to Caesar. So other stuff's being destroyed. So Caesar does not have the capacity to follow Pompey and chase him over to Greece straight away. That's going to take many months to assemble a new fleet. And even then he has to go in, in detachments across the Adriatic, which you know, leads on to the, the difficult campaign and the fighting around Diahachium, the port there, and then eventually when Caesar breaks away and is chased and will lead up to the, the Pharsalus campaign. So that's all to come. But of course, again, the show has made sure that Antony and the 13th stay at Rome, which means we've still got Antony there with Attia, with Octavian, with Octavia, with Servilia. We've got Pullo and Varinus are there with all their um, issues of one sort or another, Pullo and his slave girl and um, Varinus and Niobe to build onto things. Again, it's this is not a show that can do the Civil War in any detail, or perhaps even wants to, but it's the, those are the choices it's about the sort of home front, if you can use an anachronistic expression, and the characters and the the soap opery at times almost gangstery element about this um, these characters and their relationships. That's what they want to do, and obviously that allows them to give a more prominent role to the female characters like Atia, Sevilia, Niobe, Octavia, in due course. Um, but it makes it like any other soap opera, just with a setting in the ancient world. It, it's that sort of thing and they have to contrive these dramatic twists turns 
passions, love, hatred, betrayal, all this sort of thing. That's what it's about. That's what the storylines will be about in a Roman setting. And everything else is background, really, is context. And again, that's fine if, you know, that's what they want to do. And it obviously, you know, there are elements of it where it's done very well. Um, once again, for my personal um, taste, I would like more about the civil war and the politics and that sort of thing, but I can understand why they're not doing that. And you can't blame a series for not being what you'd like it to be. It is what it is. It is itself. Um, so again, it's an just one thing before we go that the title of the series, The Ram Has Touched the Wall. Um, it's, you know, it's an interesting thing. They don't really talk about it in the episode, but the idea was that um, you will often read there was a Roman convention, even a law, it's claimed that once the battering ram had touched the defences, the wall of a besieged city, town or fortress, that from then on there'd be no quarter, the defenders would not be, be able to surrender and be given any rights at all. It's based on, there's a, a little bit in Caesar's commentaries, it doesn't quite say this directly, and then in Cicero, again, refers to this. They're both quite rhetorical. A lot of times people have built this up to a regulation. Obviously, from the point of view of the attacker, sieges are very dangerous. They're very consume, uh, costly in terms of time. You consume a lot of food. You concentrate your army outside this um, fortress, town, whatever it might be. Concentrating lots of people, keeping them there for a long time makes it harder to supply them, risks the spread of disease, all of these things. And then an assault, if you battered a, uh, a breach in the wall and you've got to charge up through it, that's dangerous, that's likely to be costly in lives, particularly if you're, you're bolder soldiers, your leaders. So you want to avoid that if you can. So there's an element of threatening towns and you'll see this, we talked about a little bit in the video on sieges um, a while back, where you there's a lot of bluster, posturing, display and threats made by the attackers to try and persuade the defenders to give in. And there is this perception that if the sooner you give in, the better terms you're likely to get. The more trouble you put the attacker to, then because they don't want the next city to do the same to them, they're trying to deter them. So there are there are times when you have the object lesson that if you oppose me, sorry, that's it. There's no quarter. We will slaughter all the men and enslave everybody else. Um, or in some extreme case, in you know, a varicum, Caesar's men pretty much run amok and kill everybody. Um, so it isn't actually as fixed a rule or a law as people have, have tended to suggest it it's much vaguer it's one of a sort of rule of thumb perhaps um, and it's partly used as a negotiating practice whether it's being used rhetorically by an orator or whether it's in the context of negotiation saying look if you don't quit now why should i give you any terms you know you won't you won't get a second chance but actually when we look through the narratives of sieges then people can pretty much surrender at any time and they probably will get less but the um as far as the attackers concerned in most cases you just want them to surrender you want to get this over with as quickly as possible and at least cost to yourself um they don't push this in the series they don't suggest that you know there's no quarter now for pompey or for caesar now that the civil war has started um i just thought a little little mention because that's the the title so anyway episode five quite similar to episode four in many respects in that it's um very much character development. Uh, it's rather artificially concentrating everybody in Rome. It doesn't follow the, the history very closely, but it's all about showing the rivalries, the passions, the soap opera elements between our main characters. And um, it's a little bit more happens than in episode four, but it's still to some extent sort of a bridging episode to go on but it ends with caesar leaving rome so for a while caesar will be removed from the mix of our characters but nearly everybody else is still there um so that's it for today that's um hbo's rome episode five and um next time i think next time this should probably be video 99 and uh, next time we'll be on the hundredth so that will be the the q a Probably the first of those, because we've had lots of questions come in, and I don't think there'll be time to do all of them, so I'll, I'll take a dozen or so, or Baker's dozen maybe, um, or perhaps some where there are some that are similar to each other, or on a theme that I can perhaps talk about. But that'll aim to be up next week, and probably there'll be enough questions left over that we will we'll do another one of these maybe next month or something like that, and we'll answer some of those. We'll see how it goes. I haven't had time to do that one yet. I, I'm back from holidays and this is just uh, catching up with the next few videos to get them ready. But anyway, thanks for watching today. Bye.